Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar hosted by the NOAA Central Library. I am Katie Rowley, the Outreach Librarian, who will be your host today. Sorry. Uh, the library seminar program provides an educational forum for the presentation of ideas, research updates, and news in support of NOAA's mission. I'm excited to invite today uh, Kelly and Emily. Please note this presentation is being recorded and your name, email, and questions will be shared with the presenter after the fact. As an attendee, you are muted, so please place all your questions into the question panel. Questions will be asked at the end of the presentation. And if you have technical issues, such as no audio or visuals, please try logging off and back on as that solves most issues with GoToWebinar. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Kelly to introduce our speaker today. All right, thank you, Katie. Uh, my name is Kelly Samick. I'm with NOAA's National Sea Grant Office. If you aren't familiar with Sea Grant or want a refresher on what we're about and what we've been up to, I encourage you to visit us at seagrant.noaa.gov. Today's speaker is Emily Mong Douglas. She earned her doctorate in marine biosciences at the University of Delaware. While there, she volunteered for opportunities in science outreach whenever possible and partnered with the Delaware Center for the Inland Bays on a citizen science project. She put her skills and experiences to use for Louisiana Sea Grant after working as a visiting science fellow in China. Passionate about connecting people with science, for the past several years, she was part of a multi Sea Grant program team focused on sharing oil spill science. With that, I'll turn it over to Emily. Hey, thank you so much for that introduction, uh, Kelly and, and Katie. Um, as was mentioned, I'm Emily Mong Douglas, and I'm with Louisiana Sea Grant, located at LSU here in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And I'm going to be sharing with you all um, some big picture insights uh, from uh, 10 years of study of the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. Uh, before I get into it, I would like to uh, give a sh huge shout out of thanks to uh, Katie with the Central NOAA Central Library and also to the National Sea Grant Office, uh, Kelly Samick in particular, for helping uh, coordinate all of this and making this event happen today. So thank you so much. Uh, just a quick refresher on some baseball card stats related to Deepwater Horizon oil spill. Uh, the spill occurred back in April of 2010. Uh, occurred back in April of 2010 uh, when the Macondo wellhead, which was located about a mile beneath the uh, water surface um, off of the coast of Louisiana, uh, exploded and began releasing oil into the, uh, into the, the Gulf of Mexico waters. While emergency responders were able to um, retrieve some of this oil from of the wellhead directly, approximately 134 million gallons of crude oil uh, did make their way into um, the environment. Due to the large volume of oil involved, emergency responders used chemical dispersants both at the site of the spill, at the wellhead directly, and also at the surface of the water. And this was done in an effort to help uh, mitigate any impacts from the oil to break up those large oil slicks into tiny oil droplets. And I'll talk about that uh, more later. So as you can imagine with a spill of this, this magnitude and just uh, due to the unprecedented nature of this event, uh, this was the first time in history, remember that uh, dispersants were used below the water surface or subsea dispersants. Um, and also remember this is the largest accidental uh, marine oil spill in recorded history. So there were all kinds of unknowns about um, a spill uh, with these characteristics. So funding agencies stepped in to try to fill in our, our gaps in, in knowledge about what the consequences of such a spill would be. And one of those funding agencies uh, is the Gulf of Mexico Research Initiative or GOMERI. So if you're not already familiar with it, uh, GOMERI was a $500 million investment by BP from non-penalty funds. So it's completely separate from the Restore Act and it went from uh, 2010 through 2020. It was managed by uh, the Gulf of Mexico Alliance or GOMA and also a 20 member independent research board. 
So it was modeled after the National Science Foundation. Uh, Gomery funded both science and outreach efforts, and those uh, those uh, general areas that Gomery was focused on are the ones that you see here, these five theme areas. And really what they, they come down to is understanding where in the environment the oil um, moved and traveled and was ultimately transported to um, the chemical processes that uh, changed the oil over time, and uh, really thinking about how the oil and dispersants um, impacted animals and habitats and people, and what kinds of technologies could be used to, to study those different phenomena. So uh, as I mentioned, Gomery not only funded uh, research science, but also outreach efforts as well, trying to get that science out into the hands of people who uh, could use it for on-the-job decision-making or just who depend on a clean and healthy Gulf of Mexico for their way of life. So uh, I feel really lucky to have been part of that, that outreach investment. Um, one of the, the, the outreach pieces that Gomery funded uh, was Sea Grant. So Sea Grant, as you might already be familiar, we're not just one program, we're actually a collection of 34 programs uh, located across the country in the coastal and Great Lakes regions. Our mission is to promote and enhance the practical and responsible use of our coastal and marine resources uh, to develop more sustainable and resilient coastal communities and economies. Uh, we have four Sea Grant programs in the Gulf of Mexico alone, and like all of our other counterparts in this uh, Sea Grant Network, we receive our funding from the federal government through NOAA and from the individual states that we're located in. We're non-advocacy, so that makes us strong neutral brokers of information, particularly in a crisis situation such as Deepwater Horizon oil spill uh, was. And uh, the, the Sea Grant overall has a more than 50 year history serving coastal communities, including the Gulf of Mexico. So. With Gomery's uh, funding, Sea Grant was able to form in the Gulf of Mexico an oil spill science outreach team, which you see um, pictured here. So we're we were located we're located all across the Gulf of Mexico, uh, and we all have different areas of expertise, ranging from things like fishery science and ecotoxicology and chemistry. Uh, human dimensions and, and physical oceanography, as well as program management and communications. And so we worked very closely with uh, the whole Sea Grant network, but also with, uh, with Gomery to try to synthesize and, and translate um, oil spill science findings, not just funded by Gomery, but by others as well. Uh, I just wanna make you all aware that you can find um, these outreach deliverables uh, on our website, gulfseagrant.org slash oil spill outreach. We have a plethora of bulletins and fact sheets, um, recordings of our seminars and workshops, uh, educational videos, all um, contain peer reviewed published science and government white papers but delivered in layman's terms. So this information is accessible to a wide array of audiences um, and it's, it's based on vetted science. So those things are all available on our website, as I mentioned. And I would like to give a huge shout out to NOAA's OR and R, Office of Response and Restoration, as well as the other line offices of NOAA. Um, you all have been really strong partners throughout our uh, more than seven year, close to eight year program, uh, providing in, input, technical input on things like our bulletins and fact sheets and our educational videos, but also um, acting as, as seminar speakers, um, participating in workshops and uh, helping us connect more with the emergency response community and to help understand uh, where the needs of that, um, that group lie. So, Huge thanks to, to NOAA's OR and R and other offices. So as I mentioned, uh, Gomery was a 10-year a ten year investment of funds into research science as well as outreach. Uh, Gomery 
funded scientists spent the last couple of years of the this greater funding initiative uh, really trying hard to synthesize all of these oil spill findings because this was a, a huge amount of money to put into oil spill science and so you know to really help benefit society uh, it was necessary to synthesize all those findings because there were things that had never been possible to study before so uh, these are the different areas that that Gomery thematically focused on listed here and uh, based on those the synthesis uh, efforts that Gomery had, then all of us oil spill specialists on the team, we all worked closely uh, with Gomery, with the experts, to try to synthesize the synthesis, take their, um, their findings and their peer-reviewed pubs that were created from these synthesis efforts and distill them down even more to reach uh, a more broad suite of audiences. So again, those are available on our website, gulfseagrant.org slash oil spill outreach. So you saw those eight different topical areas just a moment ago. Um, but what does that really shake out into in a meaningful way? Um, well, I think that we can, we can look at it in terms of the big picture uh, as how did the oil move and change in the environment? Uh, what were the impacts to the environment, meaning like the habitat and the aquatic life and the microbes and people and what about dispersants? What sort of role did they play? So if we want to get at that first question, kind of understanding where the oil uh, went in the environment, we can really, really simplistically say that the oil went one of three places or it went these three places that are shown here. So some ended up at the surface, some more ended up um, in the deep sea, in the water, and more still ended up sinking uh, to the sea floor. And if you're thinking about how the oil left the wellhead, uh, don't think about it so much like water exiting your garden hose. Think of it more like a can of soda that's been really well shaken. And when you pop the top, think about it, you have all these, these bubbles of different sizes, um, not bubbles, sorry, droplets of different sizes. So you have large ones, small ones, there's gas being released. Um, that's similar to what happened at the site of the wellhead. So you have those really large droplets scientists found that have a lot of buoyancy and those are going to rise up to the surface of the water um, within a few hours of the spill. Then the more medium-sized droplets, they took a little bit longer, they took a few days, but they also eventually made it to the surface of the water. Uh, then you see this, this subsurface oil plume, which I'll talk about a little bit more later, but what happened was essentially there were tiny micro droplets and gases like your methane and, and things that might normally be volatile chemicals at the surface of the water, things that would be um, toxic to air breathing, animals and people, um, things like your BTEX chemicals like benzene, toluene, ethyl benzene, xylene, those things, those are getting trapped in that, that uh, those subsea currents and that created a series of what scientists call intrusion layers or ultimately like this really big one that was the, the subsurface oil plume shown here. And as I mentioned, some, some did sink to the sea floor also, but we'll get to that more later. So how are scientists studying the, this phenomena, say like at the surface, for example? Uh, well, they did use uh, maybe what I think of as kind of more traditional measures like drift cards. Uh, drift cards, to be honest, I'm not quite sure how long they've been around, but at least since the 70s. I know that uh, NOAA was using them back in the 70s to study um, the movement of of oil and the environment and drift cards. If you're wondering what they look like, they're about the size of a postcard shown here. Um, that's a, a drift card that was used during one of the Gomery studies. They are typically made out of biodegradable, biodegradable materials like bamboo. And uh, this brightly colored one here that's being held by a child, you know, there's a phone number so you can call and say, hey, I found this drift card on such and such a beach. And then, Scientists can use that information to help track where these cards have gone in the environment. 
They can also use things like aerostats, like this helium filled, it's essentially a balloon as shown in the inset photo. Um, and this aerostat, this helium filled balloon can be trailed off the end of a boat and, um, or sometimes way up in the sky even and has a, uh, it's outfitted with a camera. So it can take images of where the drift cards end up in the water. And then scientists can say something a little bit about those physical drivers, about the movement of the water and thus the transport of the, the oil in the environment. Another way that scientists can study um, the, the movement of, of our, the circulation patterns that are gonna drive where the oil ends up in the environment is through the use of drifters. And again, drifters are not something new. However, something really cool that came from this, um, by the way, drifters are, are like the ones shown in the, the lower right-hand corner of the screen. Um, drifters have been around for, for a while, but these ones are really interesting, the ones that Gomer used because they're actually biodegradable. And so through this investment of funds, they were able to release, um, I think in one experiment, there's something like 3000 drifters and to be able to better follow circulation patterns, like the ones shown here, you can see the yellow um, indicates the path of the drifters over time. And in one of the drifter studies uh, done by Gomery, sci Gomery funded scientists, uh, the drifters were unexpectedly out in the water during a hurricane. So scientists were actually able, able to observe um, water and circulation patterns during this a large storm event i believe it was hurricane isaac so that's something really interesting and unexpected that came from this um, this research so i've been talking a lot about how important uh, these understanding these surface currents and movements and circulation and so on is and um, this really comes into play when you're thinking about trying to understand where fronts are forming in the Gulf of Mexico. So you might remember that fronts are areas where two um, differing bodies of water are meeting up and then they're diverging, as you can see in this, uh, this image here where they're, they're sort of um, peeling apart from each other. And they're gonna carry with, uh, these fronts are gonna carry with them any large materials. So whether that be oil, or marine debris or sargassum. Um, and so they're gonna peel away from these divergent zones and any material that those fronts carry with them is gonna meet up at uh, convergent zones, areas where two like fronts are meeting up. And that's going to pull, pull any uh, oil or marine debris or, or sargassum, as I mentioned. Sargassum, you might remember, is kind of a big deal because it's, it's, remember, it's classified as an essential fish habitat. And so animals such as cute little baby sea turtles like this one are going to use it um, as a place of, prey, of, of uh, refuge from predators. They're going to forage in it. It's uh, got a whole lot going on. And so if the sargassum is collecting in the same space where oil is also pooling or marine debris, like think about plastics, right? Um, that's not a good situation for these adorable little baby sea turtles. So something to keep in mind. Um, all of this information from uh, understanding more about circulation patterns and so on, uh, scientists are actually able to take that information and put it into to models and try to understand more about where oil is going to go in the environment and eventually take that information and share it with emergency responders so that they can uh, you know, make the best decisions possible to try to understand where oil is going to go in the environment, what types of response measures might be um, the best in terms of uh, mitigating the, uh, the negative effects from the spill. So a lot of valuable information can come from this. So, uh, you're gonna get sick, by the way, of seeing this diagram after a while <laughs> throughout this presentation, but I think that it's it's really useful because it gives us a really simplistic, elegant view of the three major places uh, in the Gulf of Mexico where oil ended up post-spill. Uh, but as you can imagine, it is a very simplistic diagram and this only addresses physical drivers. 
So let's think a little bit more about what other biological and chemical things might be at play. Uh, when you start thinking about like that, things get complicated pretty quickly. So uh, I recognize there's a whole lot going on here, but, uh, but wait, there's more. Don't forget there were also uh, emergency response techniques that were used. Uh, I mentioned dispersants before, that's just one of several uh, response techniques that were used during Deepwater Horizon. Um, there were you know, physical barriers put up, um, oil was physically removed or skimmed from the, the surface waters. Uh, in situ burning occurred as well. In situ burning, when it's done under ideal conditions, can remove as much as 98% of the oil from the water surface. However, as with any of these, uh, these response measures, there is no one size fits all uh, response technique. And um, there are trade-offs with all of these. So like, for example, with burning, you, you hear, oh, 98%, that's really awesome. However, there's a lot of particulate matter and other chemicals that are generated from that burning process, which uh, you know, uh, responders have to be mindful of. Also, um, if the oil has become too, too weathered or too aged, it's not possible to ignite it once it, it reaches a certain amount of, of gooeyness, let's say. So uh, you really have to keep a lot of this, this stuff in mind about the, the costs and benefits and, and so on. Um, so if we go back to that, that more, let's say medium-sized uh, chaos diagram here, um, showing all the different things, the different ways that oil can be changed in the environment and how it changes from the environment itself as well. Um, we might first look at evaporation and breakdown by sunlight or photooxidation. So just prior to Deepwater Horizon, um, scientists believe that evaporation was really the, the major player in terms of uh, the natural breakdown processes associated with oil. In fact, um, scientists uh, knew that approximately up to 75% of a sweet light crude oil, like the kind that was involved in Deepwater Horizon, uh, could be evaporated uh, post-spill. However, after Deepwater Horizon, scientists found that while evaporation is still a really big player um, in, in terms of the breakdown of oil after a spill, they also found that photooxidation or breakdown by sunlight was, was quite a big deal as well. So what caused this, this shift in, um, in thinking? So it really uh, comes down to, to chemistry. Uh, scientists felt previously that, that photooxidation or breakdown by sunlight was a relatively minor process um, simply because there's only a small number of photoreactive compounds in oil or compounds that, that, that uh, will change because of interactions with sunlight. Also, another um, thing as well was that there, there were some limitations in terms of the chemical techniques that were available to study some of those compounds in oil as well, the ones that, that were not so reactive to the sunlight. What scientists actually found was that, yes, while there are compounds that they react directly with sunlight. Uh, those compounds don't just degrade and that's it, the end of the story. Um, those compounds actually transform and then they uh, break down other compounds in oil that weren't reacting directly with sunlight. So you have compounds that are directly reacting to the sunlight and compounds that are indirectly re reacting to the sunlight. So a lot more breakdown by sunlight uh, was happening than was originally thought. Um, another big player, uh, as you, you might be aware, microbes. So microbes are present, as we know, everywhere, <laughs> everywhere on Earth. Uh, we, we hear a lot of, of talk about our gut microbiome and so on. Well, there are actually uh, populations of microbes in the 
Gulf of Mexico that um, break down oil. They degrade oil because it is their carbon source, it's their food. They're present in the Gulf of Mexico uh, because we have this environment that is really rich with natural oil seeps. Um, there was one study a few years ago that showed that there were more than 900 oil seeps in the Gulf of Mexico alone. And remember, oil seeps are those natural uh, cracks in the Earth's crust that allow little amounts of oil to, to come out. And so um, that natural consistent level of small level of oiling um, allows these, these populations to, to exist in nature, um, even when you don't have a major oil spill. But the interesting thing is that these populations are very responsive to the presence of oil, meaning that uh, while maybe there might be really low levels of them during non-spill times, during peace times as I think of them, during oil spills, those populations go way up. They have a huge abundance um, in their they have a huge uh, uptick in their uh, population abundance because they have a lot of food suddenly available to them. And as they start munching up all this oil, as it begins to degrade, then their populations eventually go back down to normal, um, down to pre-spill levels again. Uh, another interesting finding from this, uh, this, this body of work, this decade of work, was that scientists actually found that microbes are finding the oil or making their way to the oil through the use of chemical signaling. So they're, they're kind of sniffing out the trail of the oil um, to, to get to it. So in this image that you're seeing here, um, there's this large oil droplet and all of these little squiggles here that are denoted by these arrows, those are actually the microbes uh, using that chemical signaling to make their way to the, the large oil droplet. So that's a pretty cool cool uh, discovery that came from this. So as I mentioned before, um, dispersants were just one of the response techniques used to mitigate the impacts of um, this large oil spill. And they were used uh, in large part to enhance the natural breakdown of oil by microbes. So uh, dispersants essentially uh, create these tiny oil droplets. They increase the surface area to volume ratio, making meaning that they make the, an oil slick into tiny little bite-sized bits that are easier for microbes to, to consume. And they do that by, as you can see in this, this inset uh, diagram here, um, all those little surfactant molecules, that's kind of the soapy part of dispersants. And I want to make this clear, never ever use soap on an oil spill, don't use dishwashing detergent or anything like that if you have a boat. Um, I've worked with enough Coast Guard people over the years <laughs> to know that I should say that. But uh, they're sort of a soap-like part of the, the uh, dispersants. And the surfactants are gonna stick in the oil, almost kind of like pins in a pin cushion. And by enveloping those oil molecules, it's gonna prevent the oil molecules from getting back together with one another to reform an oil slick. And by keeping them as small little droplets, that's gonna give the microbes a really good opportunity to um, consume that oil. So uh, dispersants actually promoted oil mixing into the water, and that had uh, some definite benefits. There were a reduction in oil slicks, as I mentioned. Um, that's good news for things like shoreline habitat, aquatic life, reducing the actual amount of oil that could coat, you know, a beach or coat, say, a, a dolphin like the one shown here in this image. Um, and it did also, because those, the oil was more mixed into the water, it did reduce uh, evaporation. So you're reducing the amount of volatile organic compounds or VOCs that are making their way into the atmosphere, meaning that it's much easier on the respiratory systems of, um, of, of emergency responders and marine mammals and turtles, anything, anyone that's air breathing. However, the flip side of that is that yes, it, uh, dispersants promote the mixing of oil in the water. So that's, again, going to reduce evaporation. Remember, we 
you said that evaporation is this really major process in terms of uh, the natural breakdown of oil. And also there were some complex outcomes. While there was increased uh, surface area to volume ratio, so it's easier for those microbes to nibble, um, there was, uh, scientists found the inhibition of some oil degrading microbes from the use of dispersants. Uh, there are also in some cases found to be the promotion, uh, promotion of development of populations of microbes that wanted to eat the corexit instead of the oil. Uh, there are also some implications for aquatic life because you are increasing the availability of oil derived compounds in the water, then that can have some toxic effects for life as well, which I'll talk about in a little bit. So if we are going back to this diagram, which I, I told you you would see many times. <laughs> so uh, we think about the surface oil. So uh, some of that surface oil, of course, made its way to shore. Um, you can see here in this, this image from Nixon et al. Uh, beaches in the top panel, wetlands on the bottom panel, the warmer colors are indicating areas of uh, more heavy oiling and the cooler colors are indicating uh, areas where there is little to no oil observed. So you can see that uh, both beaches and wetlands took a pretty hard hit uh, in both cases. So if we draw our attention first to, to beaches, you can see this, this beach here in uh, Florida. There's lots of uh, streaking from the oil. There's some buried and semi-buried uh, sand oil agglomerates and those are essentially uh, mixtures of sand and oil and shell they're all kind of you know glued together by that oil um, and scientists studied the uh, the breakdown of this oil in the beach uh, creating trenches like you can see here um, scientists digging their way down and um, here's uh, a, sort of a close-up of one of those, those walls of the beach there showing the this, this streaky material that's actually the oil in, in the depths of the beach. There's a Sharpie down here uh, at the bottom of the picture for sort of a size reference. So something interesting that came out of this was that uh, scientists actually found that there was a lot of microbial action action happening in the depths of the beach um, and that those microbes were supported in their breakdown of the oil because beaches breathe as this uh, scientist uh, Hodel put it. So essentially what happens is as we all know uh, there's groundwater uh, in under the depths of the of a, any beach and this allows uh, when the groundwater begins to ebb or begins to drop, that's going to sort of pump in oxygen and heat, uh, which is going to promote the microbe, uh, the microbial communities there. It's going to allow them to have the, the oxygen and the warmth they need to help break down the oil. Um, it's going to be supportive of those communities. And then when the groundwater levels begin to rise in a beach during, a, during floods, then um, that's going to actually pump moisture and CO2. Uh, CO2, remember, is a respiration product from the microbes breaking down the oil. It's gonna pump that out of the beach. And so this, uh, this happens uh, cyclically and is actually going to uh, really help those microbial communities break down the oil over time. Uh, so if we look at a sample from a beach, uh, like the one that was just shown in those, those pictures previously. Uh, this is a sediment core. So this is the, the surface up at the top. Then as we go down, we see that some oil has been buried and made its way down um, several centimeters into the depths of the beach. Um, the panel on the right, all of these different colored bars represent di different depth layers of the sediment. So this top, uh, top bar indicates the you know, those first few centimeters of the, the beach. So that surface layer, then there's this second layer is what I wanna draw your attention to. That's where the actual 
there's a lot of oil in that layer of sediment. This dark blue part of the bar, that's actually um, the relative abundance of microbes that are known oil degraders. Uh, something that I should have mentioned when I first introduced the slide is that um, these different colors are indicative of different species of microbes um, as found through genomic work. So using genes to understand um, who's who, who's, who's present in the different sediment depths. And so at the sediment depth where there is a lot of oil, not surprisingly, there were a whole lot of uh, oil degrading microbes. Then in the other layers where their oil was not present, you might notice that those oil degraders, that dark blue bar again, um, they, the oil degraders were there, but just in much smaller numbers. If we draw our attention to salt marshes, uh, remember salt marshes received a lot of oiling as well. Um, while breakdown by microbes does occur. Unfortunately, uh, you might remember that while uh, beaches have a lot of a lot of space in between their sand grains, which allows for a lot of air and water to flow, um, marshes are set up quite differently. Their, their uh, sediment grains are really packed closely together, and so that doesn't allow for a lot of airflow. That means that there's um, significantly less aerobic or oxygen utilizing breakdown that can happen. And so anaerobic processes are ones that, that don't utilize oxygen. Microbes that work without oxygen are able to break down the oil, but it's a much slower process. And um, it can actually take many, many decades before we see any oil um, from the marsh fully degraded that depth. Um, these images are uh, courtesy of the Coastal Waters Consortium from um, the Gomery funding. And uh, it's really interesting that oil was actually able to make its way into the depths of the marshes in some cases because of things like crab burrows. So uh, that's an interesting thing to share, I think. Um, OK. so. We've talked quite a bit about the surface. What about that subsurface oil bloom? So as I mentioned previously, some of the, the microfine oil droplets and the gases and so on got caught up in these underwater uh, sea currents. And uh, scientists used underwater vehicles to, to study this phenomena. So uh, shown in the, the lower right-hand corner is uh, the vehicle, the Sentry, which was outfitted with all kinds of different sensors and so on. And scientists drove it in this, this sort of zigzag fashion through that underwater plume to better understand what was going on at depth. And what they found was that uh, there were low oxygen areas where uh, this plume was occurring. Microbes were actually actively breaking down the plume uh, over the course of, uh, I guess, until about September of 2010, um, scientists think that about 60% of the, the hydrocarbons or the, the oil-derived compounds were broken down um, by that point. And it was, it was quite a large uh, plume, as you can see from the dimensions that are listed here. The, the thickness of the plume was approximately 660 feet, and the area that it covered was about um, 4, 000, more than 4,000 square miles, so pretty large. As for sinking, oil sinking to the sea floor, I really enjoy talking about uh, the mechanisms that get the oil to the sea floor because I get to talk about snot and poop. And as the mother of a young child, th those are my favorite topics. So um, <laughs> uh, one of the ways that, that oil makes its way down, as I mentioned, is through fecal pellets. So scientists found that uh, animals such as copepods and jellyfish uh, consume crude oil droplets. And these oil droplets are actually observable uh, under UV fluorescence. So they actually glow under UV lights in the lab. Uh, you can see here, this is a fecal 
pellet and all those little crude oil droplets are, are glowing. So it's pretty fascinating. So when they sink, uh, when those fecal pellets sink to the seafloor, they bring the crude oil along with it. Another mechanism is a little bit more uh, complex. So uh, as I mentioned before, you know, microbes, are everywhere throughout uh, the marine environment, including in the surface waters. There wasn't as much uh, microbial breakdown happening directly on the surface at the surface oil slick, um, simply because that area was nitrogen limited and um, oil degrading microbes do need nitrogen to, uh, to really do their job effectively. Um, however, um, bacteria oil agglomeration did occur. So you have these bacteria essentially colonizing oil droplets, and that's going to create a, a mucus or kind of a snotty-like substance, like the one shown here in the inset photo. This is a, a lab image, but the same thing happens out in nature. So you can see that, that snot formation. Um, and this, this uh, mucusy stuff is uh, often joins up with Marine snow and oil. And marine snow, just to refresh everyone's memories, um, marine snow is that that collection of you know dead and decaying plant matter and decaying animals and phytoplankton and fecal pellets and and fecal pellets that have oil droplets in them, fecal pellets that don't. Uh, and then of course, as I mentioned, there are just free floating oil droplets. So that that marine snow and oil and BOAs, that, that mucousy stuff, um, those are gonna meet up together and they're gonna form something that scientists call marine oil snow. And this marine oil snow can of course sometimes uh, become ingested by animals, cute, another cute little copepod, right? Uh, but also that marine oil snow can uh, team up with other particles that are in the water column, other bits of sediment and so on. And that can actually sink, uh, sink down and uh, actually pass through the deep intrusion layer or those deep sea plumes and pick up some more oil droplets along the way, make its way to the sea floor where it accumulates. Uh, and uh, resuspension can occur. And also it can land on, on things like uh, deep sea corals, for example. So with these sea corals, uh, like the one shown here on the left, this is actually an image of a deep sea coral after it's received some of that, that marine oil snow that has fallen. By the way, when it's, when it's uh, that marine oil snow, when it uh, sediments, when it makes its way down through the water column, it sinks down to the bottom, it's called MOSFA. And this was a, a new finding through this deep water horizon studies. Uh, so this MOSFA, when it, it landed on things like deep sea corals or the sea floor, there were all kinds of impacts uh, for soft sediment communities, um, any kind of benthic in fauna, a lot of them, their bioturbation uh, activities were, were lessened. And so that was mixing less oxygen into the sediments, decreasing the amount of breakdown of the, the oil derived compounds by microbes. Um, the corals themselves, getting back to those corals again, uh, you can see that this coral doesn't look too happy. It's coated um, pretty much all over, all over with uh, the, the MOSFA. You can see it's, it's pretty dark and not looking so happy. It also has some brittle stars on it, these brittle stars here in red. Uh, scientists actually found that they're a great thing for, for deep sea corals. Um, you can see the same coral, uh, an image taken close to four years later. You can see that this area outlined here in yellow where the brittle stars had been just a few years before uh, is actually really healthy and it looks the way that a coral should look. Um, the scientists found that these, these brittle stars actually acted to inadvertently uh, dust off uh, MOSFA through their actions because they kind of do this little shimmy and that sort of dusts off any of that um, that that snotty 
oil mixture that might be on them. And if you're like me and you are not an expert in deep sea corals and you look at this coral and you say, hey, but it looks so, so uh, healthy and feathery, um, all these little feathery areas shown uh, with the arrows here, those are actually hydroid colonies and those should not be on the, uh, the coral. It turns out that those are actually uh, opportunistic species and they are a sign that this deep sea coral is really, really stressed out. So it's not a good thing to see those. Um, so take home message, some parts of the, uh, the benthos, the deep sea ended up with uh, areas that got covered a bit with this uh, this MOSFA stuff and um, some areas were able to recover a little bit with some help from some uh, brittle stars. Other areas, not as much. Uh, it's estimated that the coral communities that were impacted by the MOSFA could take, uh, I believe it's like up to 30 years to, to return to their pre-spill state, if at all. Uh, Following in line with that same sort of uh, stream of consciousness in terms of impacts to, to animals, um, we have uh, a few different animals that I'll mention. Um, marine mammals, for example, like dolphins, uh, they sustained a lot of impacts to their, their populations. There is lung disease and damage and uh, chronic maternal illness, which caused reproductive failure, um, dysregulation of the immune system, which caused susceptibility to illness and infection. Um, there were mass mortality events. Uh, animals like, like sea turtles, uh, as I mentioned before, sargassum, which tends to uh, end up getting pooled with, with oil in the environment due to the occurrence of fronts. Um, so some other habitat gets gets damaged through that oiling, but also sea turtles ended up becoming mired themselves, um, coated in oil. In other words, uh, oil was recovered in the GI tracts and the the trachea, the windpipes of a lot of sea turtles. Uh, There's also an issue with sea turtles not returning for those first couple of years to their um, to their beaches to nest and lay eggs. So um, there's some hatching success variability as well. Uh, with birds, there was, uh, again, a, a bunch of different impacts you can see listed here. There's anemia and issues with the heart. Also, um, things simply just like their, their feathers uh, have receiving oiling that actually uh, impacted them in a few different ways. If you, you think about the fact that that birds actually have different types of feathers, some of them are used to to insulate their bodies. Others are used um, for flight. There's ones that are used to insulate their bodies if they're they're matted and oiled. Um, it's more difficult for the birds to regulate their body temperature, and so they end up with with hypothermia uh, in terms of the flight because their feathers are matted and they're not. Uh, able to fly well, they end up becoming exhausted and um, having increases in flying times and um, doing different types of behaviors simply because they have, um, they have a lesser ability to fly the way they normally would. Um, then with, uh, with animals like fish, there's all kinds of uh, damages that, that maybe are sort of more obvious, like things like gill damage, but there are also um, issues with heart development and deformities, um, decreased rates of uh, heart rates, there's damage to the olfactory system, so that, you know, change their, their sense of smell and, and cause problems with vision as well. So there's a lot of different uh, things that popped up with fish additionally. Uh, if we look at if we look at animals sort of as a whole in the environment, uh, scientists kind of broke them out according to their their vulnerability to oil spills, their susceptibility to injury, that middle column, and then how easily they can recover from those oil spills. So, for example, we look at something like the Gulf Menhaden, um, and we're we're looking at their susceptibility. Well, it turns out that um, scientists determined that they were not 
uh, exposed that the, they were not exposed to the oil spill or there was there was low incidence of that happening. And um, because of their their uh, their life strategy, their they have um, a high fecundity, you know, lots and lots of little babies, um, and they they because of that they tend to be more resilient. Their populations uh, population turnover is pretty quick, naturally speaking, anyway. So that makes them uh, a much lower risk and much more likely to recover. Whereas uh, animals like like shrimp, uh, for example, they have this. While they are also our strategists, meaning that they have lots and lots of young, they do have these behaviors like they tend to to stir up the the bottom sediments, which can contain oil or buried oil. So that's going to put them at more risk for exposure to oil derived compounds, which could have potentially toxic effects. Uh, but again, remember that they have lots and lots of babies, so that does make them more likely to recover more quickly. Um, then if we're talking about things like fish eggs and larvae, uh, they don't have this ability to swim away from, from the oil, so that puts them in that higher susceptibility to injury range. Uh, but again, because they're, those eggs and larvae tend to be really dispersed throughout the water, um, and there is often, there's oftentimes many, many of them um, that does suggest that they would be more likely to recover from a spill overall. So switching gears um, a little bit, then we start thinking about, well, what are the impacts to humans with all of this? Um, I'm not going to go too deeply in depth here, but I will say that uh, studies of the impacts from nine large oil spills found, you know, just a myriad of interacting effects um, from the community, from community wide to personal, uh, those that tend to be the most vulnerable are those that rely on the impact on impacted resources. Um, so meaning, you know, the environment, um, as well as the elderly and children, pregnant women, and those people that are involved in oil spill, spill cleanup. And there were, um, you know, mental health impacts that continue to be some of the most pervasive effects. Uh, but they're also some of the most understudied. And um, there's work that was done during the spill that showed that there is increase in things like, uh, like alcohol misuse and domestic abuse, a lot of that stemming from, from stress from the oil spill. Um, a lot of that came, that stress came from things like those economic effects that uh, sort of more deep orange oh, orange ring on here. Um, so having job loss or or the possibility of unknowns of uncertainty about whether or not one would lose their job or income loss. Also, there were all kinds of uh, uh, issues with uh, the formation of corrosive communities because there were, in some cases, you know. Uh, inequities or perceived inequities in terms of the compensation process or um, some people uh, feeling uh, maybe a little bit more impacted than others were. Uh, there were, however, some, uh, I guess, some, some mitigating effects, um, some positives that came from all this. Uh, people, scientists found that there were mental health impacts uh, related to being involved in the cleanup process beyond just uh, having some additional income, but also there's something about people feeling like they're, they're part, of, uh, part of this community that's rolling up its sleeves and, and doing something. And so that had a, po had a positive uh, mental health effect on folks, um, which is, is something nice to, to see as well. But there's a lot of things going on here. Um, a lot more than, than can be discussed in the amount of time allotted. Uh, so scientists tried to take some of this information. Um, you know, I just touched on just a little bit uh, from different areas listed here, but uh, scientists tried to take uh, information from models. There's lots and lots of models out there about the ocean environment and human health and um, the biology of the system and, and socioeconomics and 
tried to take information from models and different studies, as well as take input from, from groups like Sea Grant. Um, they, they, uh, scientists used input from, from the different stakeholder groups to try to really understand how all of this is working together um, in concert with one another post spill. Um, and so when you look at all of these different pieces, here on this diagram, it looks kind of uh, more simple. There's, there's four basic areas, right? And then if you really get into it, it turns into something more like this. All those, those pieces are still there, but it's, it's pretty complex. Um, the thing is everything is, is connected with everything else. So if we take, for example, something like, uh, let's say an oiled shoreline, Let's say that there's an oiled shoreline uh, during a spill. It's going to get a lot of media coverage. Maybe that information that's available, maybe it might be uh, vetted science. It might be good information, or you know, perhaps it might not be from a reputable source, or it might not be uh, a study that's completely done to completion, or it could be just a sound bite. In any case, um, that has the ability to affect the perceived uh, safety of things like seafood or maybe of the beaches and so on. And that's gonna affect consumer confidence, which can dictate things like seafood prices and how many people want to come and visit uh, a beach that they've maybe heard uh, information about on the news and it may or may not be true information, but it's it's available. Um, and that can, of course, have impacts on people's income and employment, whether they're a fisherman or they're a tourism professional or they're just someone that lives in that coastal community. Um, as I mentioned before, there have been uh, sociological studies and scientists actually found that uh, people with ties to the fishing communities or the tourism industries were more heavily than, than other folks fishing communities in, in particular. Um, and of course, you know, your ability to be employed and support your family is a, is a big thing. And also it, um, that income impacts community health. Right? Hey, because Emily, not to interrupt your flow here, but we are at it and giving you a two minute warning to the hour. Okay, thank you. So uh, community health resources that are available are definitely going to be dictated by, by the amount of funds available. Uh, and of course, mental health plays a huge role in all of this. Um, you don't have income that's going to stress you out. You don't have resources in your community to go to. That's a problem. And so maybe you're not going to work as much. That's going to affect overall welfare. So there's just it's all really complicated, but um, there's a lot of interesting and really helpful information that I think has come out of this tragedy that can help push the, the ball forward in terms of providing better support for people and for emergency responders and uh, hopefully the environment in the future too. So again, I just wanna mention uh, gulfseagrant.org slash oil spill outreach. You can check out our bulletins, our synthesis bulletins, which I've touched on just a little bit of information from all of these today. Uh, and also I just wanna say thank you so much to, to everyone involved in all of these organizations shown here. Everyone has been so awesome and supportive of our team over the years and of helping uh, us pull together information for all of our, our outreach resources. And if you need to contact anyone for questions, um, you can reach out to our team shown here. So with that, if we have like 30 seconds for a question. <laughs> Great, thanks so much, Kelly. I just wanna let people know that we did record this. So if you have to bounce now, uh, go ahead and we will put this up on the library's YouTube channel. I will also uh, record all of these questions that you're asking and send them to Emily and Emily is going to answer those offline and I will email everyone who attended today with those questions and answers. And with that, I'm gonna grab that first question and we'll answer one. So the very first question to come in early on was natural oil seeps occur from the ocean floor in the Gulf of Mexico waters. How does the quantity of accidental seepage from uh, Macondo compare with the annual quantity of natural seepage? 
That is a great question. Um, to be very honest, I can't tell you the answer right off the top of my head. It is less than the Deepwater Horizon oil spill, uh, annually speaking, but I could not tell you how much less. But we do have a bulletin on that. If you go to uh, our website and check out the publications page, uh, there is a bulletin called Oil Frequently Asked Questions. And in there, there is a a pie chart with exactly the answer to your question. Great. Okay. I, I'm not going to get into these other questions because they're going to take a little too long and I want to respect everybody's time. But thank you so much, Emily. Thank you so much, Kelly. This is awesome. Uh, you have about 30 seconds to get in those last questions uh, and I will gather those and send them to Emily to answer offline. Thank you, everyone. I hope you have a wonderful and safe rest of your Thursday. And thank you again to Emily and uh, the whole Louisiana Sea Grant. And thank you so much to everyone for tuning in. I really appreciate it. Bye now.